Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me to give a talk this afternoon here at this workshop. Um, so I'm going to be talking about uh, the process of performing health research and focusing really upon the challenges that health researchers face when they go out into the field, uh, travel overseas, and collect data uh, on health-related uh, issues. Now, I'm going to be picking up a few points that were mentioned in the session. Um, I'm going to sort of uh, expand upon some of the points that Heather made uh, earlier on in terms of talk, uh, talked about ethnographic research and some of the issues surrounding there. But I'm also, but I'm going to look at it from a different perspective, more in, in line with what Rowan was saying in terms of the institutional support that we provide. Uh, what is currently uh, available to health researchers working overseas and where we're uh, looking to develop it in the future so that researchers can do their can actually focus upon their research itself and r uh, worry less about the you know the infrastructure of what what they're doing and how they're going to do the research so tying into the idea of capacity building that uh, was mentioned earlier So first, um, obviously this is a big topic. Uh, some of the work that's informed our approach involve obviously code data was a huge influence on, on what we're doing, as well as the Research Data Alliance. I'd also like to mention the work performed by the Open Data Research Network, uh, as it was called, uh, which is now uh, called the Open Data for Development uh, uh, project. Uh, they've been a huge influence. They have an amazing ability to actually promote uh, the work they do in developing countries. Um, it, it's amazing that even, no matter how far the, uh, people are from a network access, the first thing they will mention is open data and the fact that they've been to uh, this website. So that's quite an amazing feat in what they do. They've got amazing outreach. Uh, there's also fantastic work being done uh, by the World Bank and other open data portals to look at the issues surrounding uh, sharing of health data and big data, which are uh, key, because it's important to remember that in health, we're not just uh, collecting this data for use in research. We're also doing it to uh, inform health practice. So providing this information in a way that can be used by people working in these local communities is incredibly important. And in addition, there's work by expert groups such as the Global Health Network and the Association of Data Management in the Tropics, which provide support in the field for data managers and clinical managers who are looking to uh, improve their practice over time in this area. But I'm going to put those um, aspects to one side at the moment to talk about the work we do at the London School. So London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine is a small university uh, that specialises in research and postgraduate teaching on public health and tropical medicine. So we have about 1,500 researchers in total, um, a third of which are, are working overseas, either permanently or on a sort of long-term basis. Uh, and they research topics that you will have heard in the news, Ebola, uh, malaria, uh, HIV and AIDS and other relevant areas which uh, affect the lives of people uh, everywhere. Uh, an interesting aspect of the work that, uh, that London School does is that it emphasises the, the importance of working collaboratively. So we're not just going out and doing research ourselves, we're working with uh, organisations in the field to actually uh, do these uh, do the research uh, in, a, in a more, well, working with many inst institutions more collaboratively and sharing the uh, benefits that we gain. So a key part of the strategy that they, they emphasise in big letters is the fact that uh, we're sharing expertise to strengthen health research capability uh, globally. And as part of this, um, projects, health-related projects and institutional funding is actually allocated to uh, project organisations so that um, LSHGM staff can go overseas and they will have the infrastructure necessary to do their work more effectively, more efficiently. So if there are gaps in the area like technical storage or network access or even things like access in journal publications, then uh, we will look at areas where that can be approved. And that's not just available for school staff who are working in the field, it will also benefit people, other people on site who may be from Oxford or Cambridge or other universities as well. Uh, but first, 
I want to look at the, some of the challenges for, well, health researchers, but researchers in general, in terms of working overseas. Um, at the start of a project, even before they've got funding, they will have to think of a number of issues. They'll have to identify the research topic uh, that they're wanting to look at. Uh, they, they want to look at the area they want to do the study in and uh, who they're going to study. They're going to need to build the project consortium. Uh, they're going to need to look at what kind of legal and regulatory framework is, is uh, in place within that environment related to research uh, with human participants, which is, uh, as you're probably aware, a highly regulated area. And they're also going to meet, have to meet other obligations, such as um, meeting institutional requirements for data management and ethics uh, approval, uh, funder requirements and publisher data sharing requirements as well. Now, these are huge issues for researchers who are really just wanting to focus upon the science. They want to actually do the research themselves. Insti uh, universities provide support in some of that area. So you have the research office who help you with contracts uh, and help you to prepare your research bid. You have data management services who can uh, help you to write a data management plan or uh, develop a, a standard operating procedure related to how you're going to handle uh, data in your institution. You may have other support staff who help you with um, uh, setting up projects and councils and so on. But there, in many places, there really isn't the support for researchers in terms of what to expect when going out to these countries, uh, in terms of the infrastructure that's available, some of the practical challenges that they will face. And this is a, a big issue uh, for many researchers. Um, in many cases, they're reliant upon just finding out from the grapevine. Uh, they know that someone has done research in that area as well, so they have to go and see them and chat to them about what it's about. Um, which isn't the best approach, really, as a university. We should be doing more to actually support these researchers and make sure the guidance that they're provided with is, a, is a more consistent. So, uh, to expand upon some of the aspects that uh, researchers will face when working overseas, um, each country has its own ecosystem in which different laws, regulations, and ethical standards may apply. Uh, this is a developing area. If you'd done research in India about 10 years ago, you would have found that there, there were very few uh, laws in place for doing research. Uh, but in the, since 2010, they've introduced uh, data protection laws and other regulations, uh, very similar to what we have uh, in Europe and the UK, that say things like you can only collect data and use it for a, a, a certain length of time and for specific purposes. Uh, you need to store it within an environment, as within the country, as opposed to transferring it out to perform analysis out, out uh, in, in other countries. These have huge implications for the type of research uh, people do, and also the data management practices that they have to apply. It means that uh, rather than uh, using the university facilities in London, uh, they have to rely upon their collaborators and make sure that they've got the data management infrastructure that's available. Uh, other countries in which we work have uh, slightly less defined uh, regulations. So uh, places like Ethiopia don't have any uh, requirements for data sharing or uh, open data, but they do say that you have to send them uh, the uh, health organizations a copy of any publications that you produce. And if there's any data associated with that, then you may need to provide a copy of that as well, just for context. Uh, Tanzania has, over the last few years, uh, um, uh, set out a data transfer agreement, which sets out conditions under which data may be uh, captured and used by organizations. And it's really for uh, organizations to, uh, working, uh, based in Tanzania that uh, outlines how they can interact with foreign, uh, from their perspective, uh, institutions for health research. So for instance, they have, and it's all very sensible in terms of you need to get ethics approval and you need to make sure that your um, storage is managed and backed up and kept securely. But the principle of it is that uh, it will affect the practice that uh, projects will need to apply within these environments.
So each one of these has their own challenges that need to be faced. Um, and certainly for legal experts, it's how to make sure that they're aware of any contradictions that are in place, any specific requirements, um, or, or aspects that need to be emphasized to researchers working in the field when, they develop, when they're actually planning their research project. So certainly the work of uh, people like the Research Data Alliance, uh, which recommended harmonization of uh, practices related to the capture and storage of data is incredibly useful in, in terms of addressing some of the, the differences between uh, country-specific uh, laws and regulations. Another challenge that uh, researchers face, and, and one that is uh, perhaps more important to me personally, uh, uh, because I support researchers doing data management, is that uh, because researchers are working in often resource poor locations, uh, they don't necessarily have the uh, infrastructure to do their research, to actually capture data uh, in situ and store it on a local system. And this has huge implications for how they plan, that, how they develop their proposals, how they plan the project and how they implement it. Uh, touching up, so touching upon some of the issues that uh, Heather mentioned earlier, uh, during the costing phase, uh, a researcher must determine if there's resources such as an electrical generator on site, so they can actually charge their capture devices, their laptops, their tablets, their mobile phones, and so on. Uh, they must determine if there's actual network coverage to uh, tra transfer data from different sites. So if you're going out and doing a survey uh, using a tablet and you're asking people questions and they're filling a, a survey online, uh, if you can't actually connect to the internet to transfer it to your, to your central location where that, 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 that is, you need to implement additional practices like telling your data collectors to go back uh, to the health facility every day in order to transfer the data. There are also other issues like uh, when people are working out in the field, if they don't have access to computers or data centers or other resources on site, they may not be able to access journals and other resources needed to uh, understand the area in more detail. Um, and there's also a lack uh, often in many cases it's of professional data managers who will be able to support them in the process. Um, and this has huge implications. It's a, an area of significant stress for health researchers everywhere. Uh, it means that they have to become um, self-reliant. They have to think about all these issues right at the start of the project, find the best approach possible, uh, which is not always the best thing because they know about the science and you know the background area but they don't know about technical issues uh, they need to find the best approach possible choose the software uh, choose the hardware and all the other things and then purchase them uh, in the early stages of, of the project and then find some way of getting uh, transferring the data uh, well transferring all these resources to the location where they're doing data capture so just as an example of this, and I'll have to refer to my notes here, um, Ideas is a project that was performed by the London School, and their aim was to study mothers and children during early inf infancy in Ethiopia, and Nigeria, in Utah Pradesh, in India. And they're really, the, the goal of their research was to uh, reduce uh, likelihood that uh, children and their mothers would die during childbirth and during uh, the first years of life. So as part of this, they did a number of things. They looked at uh, policy within the region for, um, for related to health and data sharing policy as well. So to see what organizations shared information. And they also did a survey of um, where they went out and, and did semi-structured interviews with parents to find out what their experience was. So uh, would, how many children did they have? Um, did, they have uh, did the children have any illnesses at different times? Uh, did any of their children die uh, in the last few years? And so on. A key part of uh, the, the requirements for this project was that they needed some kind of device, an electronic 
uh, well, a mobile data capture device to actually collect this data and transfer it to the central uh, health centre where they were where they were coordinating the uh, project. Now, five years ago, obviously they would have used well, five years or longer, they would have used paper forms, but they wanted to use uh, a phone device. So the real challenge for them in this case, uh, well, they had a number of questions that they had uh, that they came to, with, to me and asked about. Firstly, what kind of uh, mobile device that, that should they use? Uh, they knew that they needed uh, features like long battery life, and they needed it to be quite rugged so that if it was dropped, then it wouldn't break. But what other features were needed in the, uh, on the tablet or, or phone? Um, they weren't sure. They also wanted advice on what kind of software they should use. Um, should it, could it be something that would run on Android or, or uh, some other platform? Um, they, ha they knew that they wanted to uh, perform interviews in the native language, which, which is called Amharic. Uh, so that had additional requirements, in terms, uh, in, uh, well, additional implications in terms of the software that they use for data collection. Um, they also needed to consider uh, where they would buy the device from. So could they, would they need to buy it in the UK because they knew the supplier network, or could they buy it within the country itself and uh, avoid import fees? So, it, and I tried to help with them, to help them as much as possible to look at all the different options, but there were issues where uh, they needed to actually do the investigation themselves and try to uh, find the best approach. In the end, uh, they chose, a, a, and I'm sorry for the advertisement here, they chose a Samsung Galaxy Tab 3, which they found, uh, which they chose simply on the basis that it had the best battery life and it had a sufficiently large screen. Oh, and it, uh, it did support the, um, well, it had sufficient processor and memory to actually support the software that they chose, CS Pro, <coughs> uh, which, uh, according to the website, uh, that they looked at actually supported non-Latin languages such as Amharic. Uh, when they came to actually test the device though, they found that there were problems. Uh, CS Pro is wonderful if you're doing English language surveys. You can, you can develop your form, you can have uh, branching questions, you can add all kinds of logic there, but once you translate that into a non-Latin language, it turns out there are memory issues, uh, or at least there were in the version that they were testing that meant that it slowed down over time. Not significantly, but whenever they collected information and moved on to another page, there was at least a minute wait, or, or possibly two minutes in some cases. And this meant that the, the person doing data collection could, uh, was slowed down significantly. They could only interview a certain number of people during the day. That had a huge impact, well, would have had a huge impact over time in terms of the, their ability to meet their project plan and the uh, timeline that they set. They, at one stage, they were actually considering uh, going back to paper forms. Uh, fortunately, in this case, uh, they were able to get in touch with the CS Pro developers and actually get them to make an update to the software uh, within a few days, and then they implemented it uh, uh, onto their mobile phone so they could continue doing data collection um, without any other delays. Uh, but the issue I want to emphasize here is the fact that they had to do all this work in the field itself. There was no institutional support uh, available that could help them because uh, mobile data capture is such a developing field that researchers themselves don't know, uh, haven't developed the expertise uh, to use these devices necessarily. And it's changing so fast that what you knew a year or two years beforehand has now changed. So I really think there's a, a need for cross-university or cross-continental cross uh, collaboration to actually work out some of the issues not, and develop some kind of case studies of what kind of, of uh, problems researchers are having when doing data collection in the field uh, so that they can be better informed at a later date if they're doing similar research. So what are we doing to actually help address these issues? Well, it's focused upon two tiers. Uh, the London School has tried to develop its UK infrastructure in terms of making sure that all our services are accessible from 
outside the university in, in the uh, countries where people are actually doing research. Um, we're also trying to collect tablets and phones that have already been bought in projects and put them, at, well, just store them in a box for the moment so that if new projects come along or a PhD student wants to do data collection uh, using mobile devices, they don't have to buy them themselves. They can just use the facility that's already available, which seems incredibly um, obvious and a, a reasonably sensible thing to do, but it's surprising how no one has done it before. Uh, we've also set up a... Uh, a server based upon an open data kit where people can design their own uh, surveys. So they can add uh, the list of questions that they want to ask. They can add things like branching logic. So uh, if someone says no to one question, rather than going to the next one, they go to another set of questions. Um, and this server is based upon LSHTM infrastructure. So at least it's all backed up and they don't need to use uh, cloud services or well, third party cloud services or other providers that they're not too sure about. Another area which goes back to the notion of uh, capacity building is that uh, we're trying to support overseas development as well. So uh, putting funding into uh, enhancing the infrastructure of uh, sites where researchers are actually working. So this could be involved in, in extreme cases, paying for a data center so that they could actually store a large amount of data rather than relying upon the, the personal computers that may be available, uh, looking at uh, the institutional subscriptions, uh, looking at issues related to network connectivity. So hopefully over time, uh, researchers who are doing research in common areas, and obviously it doesn't, there are so many different countries in which we're working that it doesn't cover everyone, but hopefully the, the more um, commonplace areas where we do research is uh, going to be covered by this infrastructure. Um, okay, uh, We're also having an initiative where we pay for uh, staff who are, employed, who are employed overseas to come back to the UK to undertake training on topics like data management, um, um, ethical approval processes and other areas and go to meetings. Um, this happens every year around about the third week of September, so we just uh, finished another batch and I, I ran some events for that as well that a lot of people attended. Um, they were rather surprised to find that I actually existed. Even though I send out emails to the overseas forum list and you know the stuff on the website, they still didn't see that at all. Communication is a real issue. Uh, well, because if you can only communicate with people over emails and they don't check your emails, it's like, what else can you do? Uh, another issue that I want to draw attention to is the problem of existing data. So there's a lot of routinely collected health data that's uh, been collected through longitudinal studies over time. Uh, this has been collected in terms of different standards that were available at the time, uh, which have been changed. So they use different survey tools. Uh, the, the way they define variables has changed. They may have different procedures that mean that the data isn't really easily accessible. Uh, my colleagues who work on the in-depth network have really um, seen it important to improve the uh, quality of existing data that's in uh, these uh, health uh, environments in, in uh, developing countries by making sure they're more consistent. So there's uh, work being done to actually convert it into uh, up-to-date formats such as DDI, so they're a bit uh, easier to compare. Although there are still issues with uh, pe local people being quite resentful that uh, ex uh, overseas researchers are using research that they collect to themselves. So, in terms of what can be done uh, to really support the work of health researchers and researchers in general, there are a number of areas uh, where there's a need for development. So, picking upon Simon's uh, point earlier about uh, the work of co data, there's really a need for uh, academic institutions and other agencies to work with governments to make sure that they, the laws and regulations they develop for uh, developing countries are actually uh, consistent and that any local issues that need uh, are flagged up so they can be uh, addressed. Um, I think there's an opportunity for universities such as the London School, UCL, Oxford, Cambridge and others uh, to collaborate uh, seeing as we we all work with overseas partners. 
uh, there's a way of collaborating to improve the quality of information that's available on the work we do and improve the data management infrastructure that we uh, provide there. Uh, and it seems reasonable to put funding or just, you know, organise meetings such as this to discuss the issues. Um, we also need to look at how we're uh, providing data management support to data managers and researchers in the field. So looking at things like training opportunities for uh, and uh, support for data managers who are working in the country so they can learn about best practice for doing data capture and data management and data sharing is incredibly important. And as mentioned earlier, the admit network, data management in the tropics has done some great work there. So it, it makes sense to tie in with what's going on already uh, now and just expand upon it, the work. So that's the end of my presentation. Um, if anyone has questions, I'd be happy to answer them.